Hi, welcome to A Hot Take, a podcast where we interview trending authors and highlight new and exciting books. My name is Jenna Green, a YA fantasy author, author of the Imagine series and the Reborn Mark series. With me is Miranda O, oh, a contemporary chiclet author, author of the Chin Up Tits Out series, and she has both the privilege and honor of introducing our guest for today. Hi, Miranda. Hello, hello. I am so excited and honored to interview and to chat, mostly chat with our guest today. Now, Shane Wilson was born in Alabama and raised in Georgia. And all I keep thinking about is peaches when I say that. And uh, he graduated with a master's in English and is known for his magical realism novel, A Year Since the Rain, as well as the stage play called The Boy Who Kissed the Rain. So welcome, Shane. We are so excited to have you on the show today. Well, thank you so much, Miranda and Jenna. And thank you for including me on a podcast that is about trending authors. I don't know how I snuck in here, uh, <laughs> but thank you for less. Yeah, we got, we got, is it like the hashtag Shane, uh, Sh uh, yeah, Shane Wilson? Cause like you're trending, right? Well, yeah, if right, not, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll make you trending. We'll be <laughs> soon. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, it is. It's very to exciting. be on the cusp of trending. <laughs> the We're right there. Just well, just yeah. tip you over the edge, right? That's right. <laughs> well, a lot of people have said that I was due uh, for a trend uh, here soon, so maybe this is the moment. Maybe this, this is, is it. the moment. I can feel it. It's the breaking moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so now before kind of we get into your writing and your screenplay and and kind of that artistic side of yourself, um. T tell us a little bit about you from not the artistic version of mm -hmm. Shane. Yeah. What, 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 who are you? <laughs> I mean, uh, we know that, uh, but like, Cheryl, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, you know that on on a in a in a paper sense, right? Like, yes, I can show exactly. you my birth certificate or my government issued ID. Yes, I want documentation. Yeah, Shane exactly. Wilson. Let's write that social security number down. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> Get a uh, so, but I, but I. I don't know. Is that a valid answer? Um, I'm still figuring I, it out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can tell you a lot of things that I do. Like I, I am a teacher. That's, that's part of, that's part of the identity, right? Is right. that I teach college English. Uh, I've been doing that for a very long time. Uh, I have a dog and a cat uh, and that I, is part of it probably more often than I'd like it to be. Uh, <laughs> especially when one of them has to randomly use the restroom at three in the morning and I can't figure out why they're whining out of turn, you know? Uh, but, um, yeah, you know, I mean like creativity or, or, or creative pursuits have been such a focus, I guess, uh, maybe intentionally or not intentionally of my adult life that I don't really know what I am outside of that. Right. Uh, because I would say that that teaching is also a creative pursuit on some level. Um, I teach, uh -huh. I teach writing, but I also teach academic writing, which is less creative. I had this conversation with my students today about how, you know, I love creativity and I love that you guys are, are being creative, but this assignment doesn't need that. <laughs> and that's, yeah. it's really hard to live in that academic space uh, sometimes as a, as a creative person, because it so much of academic uh, pursuit is void of that kind of you have to follow the the yeah the i'm an english major and and, yeah. and miranda's outnumbered here because i'm an elementary school teacher but yeah that academic writing you have to follow the this, this system you you know mla format or apa format yeah. and you have to you know there's a i try really hard to, to help my students find places to play in academic writing because I think that uh, somewhere along the line, some people made the really terrible mistake of deciding that academic writing had to be boring. Um, I don't think that it has to be, but I also know that I'm training my students not to write for me for the rest of their lives, but to write for their other teachers and all of that. Right. And so like, while I like to allow them room to play in the writing, I also acknowledge that everyone that they encounter will not allow for that. Uh, well, and so. there's writing for uh, entertainment and there's writing mm -hmm. primarily and then yeah. there's writing for information primarily. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean you can't throw some information into the entertainment. And hey, I agree with you. Throw a joke into the yeah. information. Yeah, right? absolutely. Breaks it up a little bit. Right. Yeah. You can usually find them in the footnotes. There's usually a little. <laughs> right. Yeah, I love a good footnote joke for sure. Yeah. <laughs> 
it, and it, but you, you kind of, you said it is like, how do I identify myself out of this creative person? Because everything that I pursue is creative in some way, shape or form. And I think that stands true to a lot of artists out there, whether we are musicians or writers or painters or actors, et cetera, et cetera. It's, you kind of, always gravitate to that type of, of activity or, or, I mean, arts in all types. And then you're like, okay, well that, that is kind of my identity. And it's cool that, yeah. you know, that you follow students, like, even though I'm a teacher, it's still a creative aspect and I drive pleasure from it. And, yeah. you know, and then of course you're, you're for a uh, fur baby dad yeah. and <laughs> who doesn't love to let their dog out at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Is, well, yeah. um, it's great. I tend, it? to th I tend to think that the more valuable aspects of a personality probably are the things that we um, pursue in our free time yeah. uh, because we, we take the time that that we're given to do anything with and this is the thing we've decided to pursue right and so yeah like i could also talk about how i probably play more Fortnite than i should uh but the 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 real serious pursuits of the of my free time are ideally uh creative and there's something uh miranda and jenna that that i've been struggling with a little bit and uh i'm so glad that i get to talk to you ladies about it let's Let's hash it out. Let's heart to heart this thing, yes. because uh, the I think I've I've struggled because as of late, I feel um, like my creative energies have been low um, and that I've sort of like reached the bottom of a tank in some way. You know, I, I you like a year or two ago, I would have I had so many projects, right? I had I was drafting a new novel. I was editing a novel. I was writing a stage play. I was finishing an album of music. I was like, I, there were so many things, you know? And, um, and now it seems, uh, and, and I don't know what to blame. I think I could probably blame all of this that's happening just around us right now for just making me emotionally like tapped out. Yep. But um, it is, it's a been, it's been a real struggle. And, and as someone who's been creative for so long and, and had decent output, it feels, I almost feel guilty uh, on some level for not, continuing or not actively pursuing some of those things now uh i was wondering what you uh ladies oh i get about that. that i get that well and miranda <laughs> probably gets it more than i do because of the exhaustion factor like when i get home and then i put my kid to bed and then i do my marking and then i plan for the next day and i have like an hour before i have to be asleep and i'm like i could lie on the floor yeah. <laughs> and possibly play candy crush but possibly just lie there or get <laughs> off my butt and write something it is a hard battle. Um, yeah. And Miranda with a, a little baby. Yeah. I don't even know. You're just covered in drool all the time. So. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> get puked on probably like on average twice a day. So today was spaghetti bolognese. It was great. <laughs> so wearing black for a reason. Right. Um, but yeah, you know what? I'm glad that you brought this up, Shane, because I have been thinking a lot about this um, lately as well myself. But it, it, besides being a new mom, th there's so much going on in the world and so much going on in social media and the news. You know, you turn on the TV, you open up a browser on your computer, you even open up a browser on your phone and it's hammering all this negative news and it doesn't bad matter, bad, 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 bad. right and it's, yeah. it doesn't matter how fast you scroll through it to find the next positive thing or the next funny video or whatever it is we're still absorbing that in some sort of capacity and even though we're not consciously reading it and and taking it in our subconscious is still absorbing that and i think it drains our life cup and and I think as artists, we go through this kind of up and down ebb and flow type thing where last year I was in the same spot a year and a half ago before, you know, choosing to start a family. I had so much on the go. And now I'm like, OK, let me just get through the day. Mm -hmm. And I very much struggled for the last couple of months because I, I told everybody that I was leaving work. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write a book on my six months off. So I'm not only going to deliver a baby, but I'm going to write a book. I'm going to continue my podcast, this, this, and this. And then like six months happened and I've written a chapter. I'm like, oh, girl, 
Um, so I felt really guilty about it, but then at the same time, I'm like, you know what? No, I think I need to take a step back and just live my life and refill my cup because there will be a time it's like, you're just kind of in that down slope right now. So, you know, fill it up, fill it up, get as much from the outside positive as you can. And then all of a sudden you're just going to explode with a bunch of creativity could be next month. It could be in six months. It could be next year, but you know, to never kind of feel guilty if you're ever in a downspout. I think that that's just kind of the natural process and balance of life, especially yeah. in the creative world. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because uh, like the ideas are there, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that, like I have, I have the ideas, but the execution is something that I've been very good at and very consistent at. And I just have no get up and go for lack mm-hmm. of a better word to, to do it. I'm like sitting on edits right now for my publisher. They're probably like ready to get those back, you know, uh, I've had them for way longer than I ever normally would have. And I know I'm like every Sunday, I'm like, oh, you know, I could like go in there and spend a couple hours on that and get that done. Or I could not. And uh, just like and not feel any better about myself because I avoided it and not feel any more productive or or and not do anything more productive. Right. Just not do anything. Uh, and uh, and yeah. that would be fine. I, 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 I do understand or at least I believe that the the human machine only has so much emotional capital available to it at any moment. Uh, and in the last five to five years or so, we've we've been bombarded by uh, traumatic global experience after traumatic global experience to the point that we don't even have a moment to grieve the million, like the hundreds of thousands of people who have died. Re- like we don't even have a moment like to to think about that and process this massive tragedy on a global scale because we're dealing with the next thing. Yeah, I'm still um, pro- trying to process March from right, like, tw- from like, <laughs> let alone what happened yesterday. Yeah, and, and like, and it, it creates back there. <laughs> really uh, a- oppressive backlog of of emotion. I've been calling it emotional congestion. Yes, uh, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, it, emotional congestion uh, is a term that um, a friend of mine in college came up with, and it's very reminiscent of that. That what we were talking about back then, this idea that everything is just backed up. And, uh, be- and I think now it's because there's just so much of it that it's clogged up the system. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I, th- I think that emotional capital is directly related to creativity. Yes. Uh, and if you don't have the capital to spend on that pursuit, then you're probably not going to do it. And right now I'm just kind of like trying to feel my way through what, what a, uh, lull in that process looks like, you know? And every project tends to go through, its own like journey. Yeah. Like I've written some books that took me like 12 years and I've had books that have popped out in like three months and there's one, you know, like every, even a book in itself will go through its lulls. And it's like, you could be writing like five, you know, 10 chapters that fly out within five hours and then it just stalls. Yeah. And you're like, uh, story. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and you're looking at the characters going, you were writing this thing by yourselves. I barely had to participate. Now you just, oh, you need a break. Okay. You, I'll just wait yeah. you out. Oh, okay. Muse, let's go. And you just sometimes <laughs> I, it's what it is. And you're just like, no, I'll wait till you're ready. Like it's an interesting thing. Um, kind of hard to like analyze, but that's just what it's like. Yeah. I, um, I still believe that the, the best way to be creative is to show up every day and do the work. Uh, but, I think the the question that I've just been faced with on many days in the last couple of years is what do you do if you just don't, if you don't have that energy to show up that day, you know, uh, does that make you less of an artist? I don't think so. It probably makes you more of one, uh, if anything, <laughs> yeah, uh, probably. right? Like the, the, the struggle, the, um, I mean, it's all a struggle, right? And yeah. and it, on on some other level, it starts to feel like, oh man, like why am I like so worried about my little stories, right? Like think about all the all the other stuff. Like it seems that it should outweigh this this thing that is incredibly important to me, but it also feels so in like just so uh, tediously small, else. right? Yeah. Uh, in in light of everything else, yeah. Mm-hmm. But when everything else goes to, we turn to <laughs> artists. Yeah. Yep. We t- that's where we get our solace. Yeah, we yeah. do. We escape in music. We escape in books. We escape in binging TV shows and movies, right? Yeah. And 
Um, you know, it's, it's funny that you should say like it, emotional congestion, like it, it's, I feel like it's part of the creative process to take the days off simply yeah. because, you know, sh showing up doesn't necessarily to me anyways. And this is kind of what I've learned about, you know, talking to other writers over the years is showing up doesn't necessarily mean showing up to the computer, opening up a word document right. and actually typing words, showing up maybe means just mindfully thinking or maybe even not even mindfully just thinking about it in the back the back of your mind going you know what i'm gonna build on a character or maybe build on a scene or build on an idea and it doesn't have to be very productive but at least it's sitting in the back of my mind and kind of the gears are working and i'm binge watching a tv show and I'm like, oh, you know, that it, it's likens to something that I want to write about or there's a connectivity or a relatability. And still like that could be part of your creative process. It's not like you're going to be copying the TV show you're binging. Right. You're just processing it, going like, yeah. I like this idea. Maybe I like the way that the characters interact or I like the back setting or I like how, you know, the writer went and chose to, you know, use the point of view of the story. Um, I definitely think that that's something that we, we often miss as giving mm -hmm. ourselves credit for, but we should, and we definitely deserve yeah. to, because there's a lot of people that just binge watch mindlessly and don't mm -hmm. ever think further than that. But right. I think as artists, we're always watching or reading or listening and trying to connect something to our next piece or to a piece down the, down the road. Right. When I'm yeah. stuck. Yeah. I go for a walk and my husband gets frustrated because sometimes my walks are an hour and sometimes they're four minutes. And he's like, what kind of walk did you do in four minutes? I'm like, sorry, an idea came. And I like, yeah. I just, I'll write a scene go for a walk. Sometimes it's like, I'm gone for a while. And sometimes I'm like, I barely got my shoes on. <laughs> yeah. For a little while, uh, playing the guitar was my walk, uh, right? Like I would, if I got stuck, I would just play the guitar for a little while. And then that would, that would loosen up the brain some, uh, I, I believe that, and this is just something that I've been reflecting on over the last little bit. I think that's such an important part of my process as a creative is the lived experience, right? Like you were talking about like consuming television and, and you sort of like, it's a, it's a, it can be a case study and narrative and you can learn some things from that. But I also think that for me, at least, it's so important to get out there and mix it up with the world. Uh, and there's just been so few opportunities to do that uh, over the last little bit. And like, that's where I mine uh, ideas, right? Is through like experience. And uh, the fact yeah. that I haven't had as many opportunities to get out there and, and mix it up is uh, is probably another source of the drought, right? Because there's yeah. just a little a little less of that, and so I've had to replace that with other things like you know reading more, doing research, and stuff like that. Um, it's a little disappointing because I had just started like playing in a new genre when when like the 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 fatigue really hit me, and so there's that that there's that part of I mean as artists we're always uh, just rife with uh self crippling self-doubt right uh about the thing that we're working on and so if, if once i like got clogged up in the middle of this new manuscript and a genre that i hadn't worked in before i was like oh well maybe i'm just a one-trick pony you know like maybe i can only do this other thing that i've done three times right um but yeah i mean i don't know i know i, I know this is supposed to be a hot take and all i came in here with was like um I just like peeled the scab off and wanted to talk to you guys about my feelings. But <laughs> all I can think about that though now is Yeah. Well, and and all I can think about now is like analyzing this area in literature. Cuz I have an English degree, you know, you you mm -hmm. talk about Victorian literature and you talk about modernist literature and you talk about postmodern literature. I can't wait when I'm like 80 years old to go back and analyze pandemic literature yeah. and like pre pandemic like, and we won't know till years later how to analyze what we're currently in. And there's yeah, I be believe like, it'll probably be like the next, like you, you talk about the academic, like the benchmarks, right? Um, I would argue that post postmodernism, right? Whatever they end up calling that post -post -post is probably, yeah. Like yeah. that, that probably runs from the, uh, the, the wide availability of the internet. Uh, to the pandemic, I, I think. And then the pandemic sort of triggers like the next shift, whatever that mm -hmm. means, probably probably more inward, whereas the internet put us more outward, right? Um, and, and made the, the world smaller. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, 
like it made us feel like we could reach out and talk to anybody, whereas the pandemic made the world feel much larger and and much more vast and much and more. That we empty. couldn't talk to anyone because right. they're gone. Yeah, and so how do we internalize that and and put it out? And you guys were talking about music, and I've been uh, really struck by a lot of the music that has come out of of artists that I think that I've always respected, but have made, I think some of their best music, uh, in the last two years. And I would point, uh, unashamedly at the Taylor Swift albums. I thought that folklore is a masterpiece and that's a masterpiece of isolation and desperation. Right. And, um, I think we're, we all probably are just kind of waiting for that for us to get a little unclogged so we can, mm -hmm finally grapple with the the weight of this moment in our art nice i like that but just yeah. while you're here we can still talk about all the amazing art the stuff that i've done that before. you've already <laughs> created well yes because i want to know more about so you have the novels a year since the rain the smoke mm. in his eyes and the boy who kissed the rain they're all yeah. part of a series correct Sort of, yeah. It's an extended universe that I was writing in for a while. Uh, the world of muses, universe. correct? Yeah, like, that's what I want you to tell us about more about yes. this world that you've created. This well, universe. Yeah. So it's it's very similar to the world that we live in. Everything is basically the same, except for there these elements of magic. That's the magical realism, right? That everything feels very similar and then eventually as you're reading you're like hmm something's not quite right with this or everything's like this the same and then weird. oh a dragon hmm. yeah right exactly um no dragons in my stuff though sorry <laughs> uh, but muses right and so like i've sort of played with the idea of the old of the old muse and uh part of the mythology of the world of muses is this school where muses are trained and it's like hidden off in the mountains and nobody really knows about it or how to get to it and the muses are trained and then they're sent out into the world to inspire the person that they were meant to inspire um, or the people, right? In some cases. And they're all sort of trained in different, uh, in different methods of, of inspiration. And, and not, they're not all uh, inspiring artistic creation, though some of them do in the traditional sense, right? Uh, but other muses inspire people to grow uh, or to evolve or to, they inspire them to move beyond grief or trauma. Uh, and so like all of the muses are kind of equipped with their own skill set. Um, but the muse is never the focus of the narrative. Uh, the muse always sort of comes in to save the day, right? Like for lack of a better word. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's that's sort of the the school where like it's the. Um, oh, God, what did I even call it? It's been so long since I named the thing, but it's like Miss Graves uh, school for young girls or something like that. Um, and Miss is uh, the name Miss Graves comes from uh, Robert Graves, uh, who wrote the manuscript The White Goddess, and the White Goddess was sort of the British version of the Muse. Uh, that's sort of like where all that like stupid literary illusion stuff comes from, right? But uh, regardless, like all of the Muses in the universe attended this school, and then they've like gone out. Um, the only way that we know about the school is because one of the guys fell in love with his Muse, and when she disappeared, he went looking for her. Uh, and it took him to this old, like, rundown school in the mountains. Um, and that's in the smoke in his eyes for anybody who's interested in that. But, yeah, so that's sort of the thing that connects. That's the connective tissue throughout the whole thing. But each story is a standalone story. And there's also kind of a universe-wide arc that is happening. But think like MCU stuff, right? Like Marvel Cinematic Universe stuff. Because each story stands alone, but they all also build up to this one big apocalyptic event that happens to the universe that is sort of separate from what's going on with the muses so they 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 some those are sometimes classified as like companion books where yeah. you don't have to have read all the books um there are little and, nuggets in all of them for you right like if if you yeah. read all of them then you would see references to each of them in in the other books but those references aren't something that would confuse somebody if they hadn't read you know what i mean yeah um it's that kind of thing so um like when when the guy discovers this school, he finds a, like a sign in, like a roster, right? Uh, and ha he's reading through the names. And on that list of names, you see the names of other muses in the other books. So like that, there's that little nod, right? Little things like that. But, uh, but everything is completely independent uh, from each other. And there aren't even that, there are a few sort of um, character crossovers that happen, but they are, again, like they're very self-contained and, and independent. 
Interesting. You don't see a lot of books about muses. And then the idea that they're in charge of like inspiration, not just art, inspiration. I love the idea that, like, I know you say that they're not the central focus, but they are part of the premise. And that idea that, you know, you can inspire someone to try something new or inspire someone to, you know, finally let go of grief. Right. Right. That's yeah, a very these books are, interesting. These books are uh, so wildly adult, right? Like in every single way that they could be. But I've always kind of wanted to write a YA story just about the school because I feel like it would be a really cool uh, place to set a story like that and, and focus on young mm -hmm. characters. Uh, but man, like as a gateway drug to these other books, like some people would would get freaked out when they when they crossed over, you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's I still think it's kind of a good a cool idea at least to to think. About. I love that idea. I think in the day we are in a time where we have information overload, right? Mm -hmm. And we can basically Google search anything, and it will back uh, back ourselves up with right. whether it's right or wrong or real. <laughs> Like, you yeah. know, it, yeah, I, I saw something. It was just like, if I, I want to, like, I'm more confused than ever. So I saw something. It was, it was a guy, I don't know, whatever, but he said, I want to Google, does coffee make me blind? And so right. he Googled, does coffee make me blind? I saw this. And, yeah. Right. And then it's like, yeah, if you drink three cups of coffee, you're increasing your chances of glaucoma. And he goes, does coffee help reduce the chances of becoming <laughs> blind? Yes, coffee has been linked to right. different studies and how it reduces your chance of becoming blind. So we are in this information overload. So if you were to write something YA and direct it to these young adults and have or kids, young, yeah, young adults and give them something that's relatable, but educational and inspiring um, versus all the nonsense on Google, whether it's true or not true, like it just it, it gives something that they connect with that's not the Google search engine out right. there. And I absolutely love that because again, it's overwhelming to go out there and to find inspiration or to get something that's not negative on the internet. Right. So if I can pick up a book, a story and it be inspirational and educational, but also quite fun to read, then, Hey, I'm hooked on that. Yeah. And I, and it resonates with me for life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, right now there are four novels and a stage play, uh, set in, uh, the world of muses. Two of the novels aren't out. One is out next year. And then the, the fourth one is, uh, in the drawer, uh, while I try to figure out what I want to do with it, but like, there's still a lot of stories there. Right. And so I decided to, to pause on the, on that particular, story for a little while and then maybe come back to it and with maybe with the ya thing maybe with something different i've got a couple of different ways that i could that i could go with the next chapter right of this uh world of muses story but it, it's a fun place uh it's a fun sandbox to to play in uh but then you know like i uh ended the world uh in in there so now i've got to figure out what to do with what's left, you know? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> like, how do we rebuild? Right. Like, the Oh, thing, writers right? always writing ourselves into a corner being like, ha, yeah. wonder who's going to get you out of the, Oh, it's me. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, like there's, there's all, I have this like great desire to do the thing that, that no post-apocalyptic writer ever really does, which is uh, start on day one after the world ends. Like, cause you have a lot of, there are a lot of issues with starting a story on day one after the apocalypse. Right. Because you don't have any systems in place. You don't have any way to get electricity or food or anything. You have to come up with all that stuff, right? But yeah. like the cheat code is to just start the, the story 15 or 20 years after the apocalypse where all that stuff is already set up and you can just like move on with your life, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but the positive thing about, you know, taking on that challenge to write about day one after the apocalypse is that if you do is that, I'll be more ready world, for the apocalypse. Yeah, you will be prepared. <laughs> you know who I'm calling in an apocalypse. Right. Yeah. The guy that, the guy that pretended, <laughs> the, the guy that LARPed the apocalypse in his novel, right? Like, just make sure phones can work because otherwise, we're right. Right. Yeah. That's okay. We're, um, we just, we'll just head towards Georgia. Yeah. I don't know what yeah. direction it is. It's yeah, south. Just head from south. south. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But don't go to Georgia because I feel like in the apocalypse, those people would be dangerous. 
Uh, I'm in North Carolina. He's heading uh, south or north. We head <laughs> south we're north? in the m- middle. Yeah, we'll hey, let's meet in um let's see, what seems like a nice place? Montana? <laughs> yes, Yellowstone. Hello. Sorry, just sure. finished watching. Well, I don't have to I drive mean, that far. That's an unless, hour and a half. Unless the reason that we have an apocalypse is like the Yellowstone super volcano erupted, then we probably need to go somewhere else. Yeah, or we're all dead anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> we're hopeful hopeful thinking here you know? yeah right we, that's a great note to end on uh <laughs> apoc- post-apocalyptic survival notes um yes. but also we were talking about connections and reaching out so um what if people have been absolutely inspired by everything you said today where can yeah. they they locate you well if anyone is interested in talking to me further about my feelings of hopelessness uh, and sadness over the state of the world. And, then they and inspiration, apparently. <laughs> yeah, right. At ShaneWilsonAuthor.com uh, and on any of the social medias that matter, I guess, at that Shane Wilson. That Shane Wilson. That one. I that should one. call it this, this Shane Wilson, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be able to say that Shane Wilson now that I'm trending, though. Yes. There you go. Yes. And we'll make sure to include those links in the podcast description for everybody to uh, share, like, and follow you and, and find your work out there. Absolutely. I like Thank that you. it's that. I, it just reminds me on my suitcase, I always write mine. And pe- my, yeah. my mom used to be like, well, why? I'm like, because it's mine. They're like, well, what if someone else grabs it? I'm like, it doesn't say theirs. It doesn't say yours. It says <laughs> mine. And I'll have That's it. So and I'll know well, it's mine. Know, and she would just circle around for hours. Being I like, love a good who's on first and I'm like, routine. It's mine. <laughs> Love a good who's on first routine. That's, the, yeah. that's so good. Go over crazy. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for being on our yeah. show. I know you talked about like, you know, not feeling that creativity, but it's, you know, not right now. And it's okay to pause. It's okay to set a work aside yeah. and say, it's not ready. And it's okay to set aside some work and say, I'm not ready. And yeah. That and you know, there's ebbs and flows. I mean, I write lots in the summer, and I don't think I've written more than two yeah. words this month. And then just that idea of inspiration. So, thank you well, for again, thank you. It was I great. I've been, I think I've been looking for a space uh, to explore these thoughts a little bit. So, thank you, ladies, for giving me the space to uh, like work the room a little bit and find and and sort of think through some of this stuff. I feel well, like we yeah. molded that play doh a little bit, you know. Yeah, we so, had a heart to heart, like I said at the top. Creator. You know, like we really. Yeah. Well, and it'll be interesting to see in the comments, you know, um, as this gets published, what other authors are feeling or readers or creatives. So that'll be a great discussion to have. Just while we wrap up, though, now, um, a big thank you to Creative Edge Publicity and the um, Author Library Network. And, of course, all those people that are going to be writing those comments, Uh, all our viewers and all our listeners, thank you very much. You're what makes this podcast happen. Bye. Thank you.